As said before, my name is Andrea Pompili, and today we will talk about uh, uh, something that is called uh, cyber threat hunting. Uh, first of all, a question for all of you. Uh, do you know what is a CM? Raise the hand if you know what's a CM. Okay. Tell me who is afraid about the CM? We hate the CM because the CM has not logs and everything is worse and CM is complex and so on. This is the end. <laughs> okay. I know that some of you are very happy regarding the CM. The real problem is that, and I want to introduce this, that when talking about cyber threat hunting, uh, I started working on this in 2000. The big problem is that uh, there is a story, there is a sort of paradigm that needs to be solved. Uh, we call this starting from an undefined posture to a reactive posture, proactive, predictive, blah, 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 blah. The concept is when you perform only retro hunting, which means there is the problem, and then I try to understand the problem, looking at logs, computers, whatever. I am doing retro hunting, I am doing post-processing activities during an incident. Uh, most of the companies are moving from a reactive point of view to a proactive point of view. We call this at the end the real-time threat hunting, which means I know that something wrong is in place, I need to understand why this happened, and I need to enforce my perimeter. This is how it works. Uh, there, is, there are currently a lot of uh, studies to move to the predictive part that uh, is based on automated threat uh, simulation, which means I generate, for example, a digital twin of my network. I test things there. I check if my countermeasures are good enough, uh, if uh, they exit a new exploit, a new procedure, a new techniques, whatever. I will prepare my system better and better and better. So it's a sort of interactive uh, cycle that continuously happens with scientists that generate uh, new machine learning models, train new machine learning models, blah, 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 blah. Currently, in my, unfortunately, in my life, uh, most of the situations are in the middle between the reactive and the proactive part. We will explain on this. Let's start on. Every one of you know what is the threat hunting loop. The concept is simple. You have four steps. The first one, you develop an hypothesis. I know that something wrong is happening in my network. Probably, I don't know why, because someone called me in the night, or because uh, I have a threat information, or whatever. Then I have to investigate the hypothesis to understand if it is true. This means that I check on my data sets to understand what's happening. Then I uncover patterns, which means I know that this is bad. I need to understand why it's bad and how we can detect it in a more effective way. And finally, I improve my detection and response posture. Uh, this cycle is continuous. Uh, the problem is how I introduce a new hypothesis, how I can uh, investigate it, how it can uncover patterns and improve detection and response capabilities. Uh, there is a definition that has been defined by Microfocus. It's uh, a vendor that produces that site. Uh, that say, okay, two main things that you have to do if you want to perform a, a good cyber threat hunting process. First of all, you have collect the data. Easier. How much data? All the data. As much data as you have, as much you can investigate, as much you can discover patterns, and so on. Second, stay up to date for threat intelligence. Because threat intelligence gives to me visibility of what is bad in my network independently by my network, because I know a specific process, a specific pattern that is used by an attacker, and I need to search inside my data set if this pattern has been applied in my network. This means that in their opinion, if you have these two, you are doing a cyber threat process. Let's check for this. This is a more technical view of what I said before. I divided the world in two main uh, pillars. The first one is the validation process, the investigation process. The validation process means 
I have my countermeasures in place. I have an alert. Uh, I perform normalization, correlation, indicator matching, blah, 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 and so on, because I discovered that something wrong is in my network. This is typically done by CM, or so or call it as, well, as you prefer. I have a report that is sent to a people, and I have then the SOC, the Security Operational Center, or the CERT, or whatever, that try to contain the problem. Contain the problem using the information of the report. So this means that I use the report, the information of the report, to understand that I can take the whole, understand things. But the concept is that I need only to validate that an incident is in place, and need only to react to this incident. In the same time starts the investigation part. Uh, in most of the cases, you have uh, two kind of layer inside the security operational center. The first one is the people that are monitoring continuously the network, uh, check for things, solve things, respond to the attack. Then you, uh, you have what is called the third tier, that are the people that perform penetration testing, incident handling, and so on, that usually works in the other part and perform threat hunting. So long-term collection. I need to see data sets also from one year ago, two years ago, to understand. Dashboarding, re-indexing, fast search, because I need to search, oh, I have something wrong. Just check for this. Imagine that you have 10 years of data inside your NoSQL database. Probably it takes a bit of time to have information, but you need to have it in a short amount of time. And indicator matching. I use threat intelligence to search things like this. Uh, as you can see, both the two comes from the countermeasures. This means that in one case, I use the countermeasures to generate an alert. In the other place, I use countermeasures to log what's happening in my network. So this means that in one case, I am only interested in respect to the intelligence of the countermeasures. In the other place, I need to have the completeness of the information coming from the countermeasures. If the countermeasures don't tell me anything regarding my domain, probably I cannot do threat hunting. So in most of the cases, this is mainly a log collector. I collect every log, whatever. Imagine that you have to collect logs from a domain controller. You can have tons of logs there. No. The real problem is how I can generate an hypothesis. OK, I know a friend of mine that is able, like metrics, to see the metrics and say, OK, I have the problem here. Yes, but this is not true, usually. What happens usually is that we use CM alerts. The CM send me, ah, there is something, something strange in my network. I have to do something. Yeah. The real problem, uh, I take it from the internet, that CM, unfortunately, is not so precise on the alerts. For example, you have tons and tons of alerts. You have tons of false positives. So it's very hard to understand, coming from the CM, the hypothesis and to analyze them. So what happens, for example, this is the real experience, detect this only for statistics, and then when someone calls, I will look at the alerts and check the real, real alert for me. So there is not a way to generate an hypothesis coming from this. So the only things that I can do in search for indicator of compromise. This is what we usually see very used in companies and militaries and so on. They say, I catch a good threat intelligence feed, or I generate my own threat intelligence using a very strong team that generate IOC for me. Then there is someone that called them IOA, IOC, lot of confusion regarding what they are there. The concept is I search for some traces that are in my network that can be related to an attack. Uh, the real problem is that if I work with IOC or IOA or whatever, I am only working on known threats. You know that Roomfield say that uh, the problem is that matching known knowns, known unknowns, and known unknowns. We are working on known knowns. When I know the IOC, I know exactly what is bad. I'm searching for this. This means that I am doing only retro hunting. Also, if I discover the indicator of compromise now and I search in my database now, I am doing retro hunting. Yes, seconds, minutes, but it's retro hunting. The real problem comes next. I have to investigate things. This is an example of an incident that we managed a bit of months ago. Let's check for something interesting in this amount of logs. 
if you have uh, 100 gigabytes, one petabytes of logs that needs to be analyzed to validate the hypothesis. Yes, we can use a NoSQL database, searching, and things like this, but the concept is that still you have a huge amount of data that needs to be analyzed. And then you need to understand something from this. So the problem is not only I have tons of data, then I need to prepare the data in some way. Yes, currently we have Elasticsearch with Kibana that solved a lot of issues because you can see there in dashboards, PS, charts, and whatever. But the problem is still remains. If I need to understand something, I am searching the needle in the haystack. So uh, when I started working since the beginning in 2001, 2000, 2001, doing cyber threat hunting, there not exist the CM at the time, uh, the concept is, OK, they give to me tons of logs. I need to uh, compress them, then uncompress them, search with grep there, search for things, separate them using uh, the VI, then search for things, correlate things, and the best tools that we have to correlate things is Excel or Access or similar, or the best people use MySQL or Oracle or whatever. But this is what we have. And we can load only a piece of logs every time. Now, the good that is starting from 2000, we have the cyber threat thing 2.0. The concept is, we have the data lake concept, so why don't you use it? So we have countermeasures in one place. We have not only the CM, we have also the SOAR. The SOAR means doing quickly, more quickly, stupid things that I did manually when I look an alert on the CM. So this means that currently, or the playbooks that exist from the SOAR are simply, I'm doing the same checks, the same checks very quickly, because I don't mind the respect to the false positives. Simply, I let do the validation of the machine. This means that I lose a lot of resources trying to understand things, but it's enough. The good comes on the data lake. I have countermeasures plus plus. This means that I can collect more things with respect to the countermeasures. I can collect access log from the websites. I can collect the things that are very uh, huge in terms of amount of data, because then I use analytics, machine learnings, the magic of machine learning to understand something. So the paradigm changed in this way. I can I use artificial intelligence supported behavioral matching. What does it mean? I don't work on the IOC, but I work on the process, the attacker managing said the network to understand if it's something in place. Uh, every one of you knows that exists the meter attack matrix. Everyone now talks, ah, meter attack matrix, meter attack matrix. The concept is, if I know the threat actor, what are the techniques and tactics they use, I can train a machine learning model use the classification, deep learning, how you prefer, then apply this to a data lake and search for things. Blah, 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 until I search something interesting. This is currently the process that everyone is moving on. All the CM are becoming a data lake. Uh, all the CM are strongly based currently on machine learning. There, is, there are two paradigms that currently are in place, technically speaking. The first one is, I have the sources, I use the CM to collect everything, and then I upload everything inside the data lake. Uh, the real problem is that, first of all, suffer about the bottleneck of the CM. The CM architectures come on the, from the past, are based on the fact that they usually manage uh, 1,000 events per second, 5,000 events per second, 10,000 events per second. In this case, if you want to populate the data lake, we are talking about 1 million events per second. So there is a problem how many data I can collect using the CM and then upload it in the data lake. So the CM is a problem because the architectures that currently exist, uh, for example, I have a company that to solve this deployed 10 CMs, 20 CMs all together paralleling working and loading that in the data lake. And finally, uh, because um, one other problem is the complete history of time, we'll talk it after. And finally, this process is schema on write. We will talk it next during the talk. Schema on write means that the data is normalized, parsed, uh, and filtered before it is indexed inside the database. So everything is done before 
everything comes in the NoSQL database or in the SQL database or whatever. Now, th this has a big problem because if I normalize things since the beginning, I cannot re-index it next. Suppose that I am collecting a specific log and I discover after uh, two minutes that a specific field in the log is important for another machine learning models that can detect better a specific attack. Unfortunately, the data is in the database, so I need to extract it from the database and reparse it again. So this is the main problem of this process. For this reason, everyone is working in this way. Uh, this is, for example, Xabin works in this way, Splunk works in this way. The concept is, I have a data lake that will store all the data, and then I have the CM that works on specific sketch of the data set and manage all the collection, the cyber threat hunting capabilities. Uh, this is schema on read. After the data is written in the database in a raw way, this is loaded, normalized, filtered, blah, blah, parsed, and so on. So it's very good for re-indexing, because if I need a new field, I simply change uh, the template, apply it to the data set, and I have the new field immediately. Second, this is important. Unfortunately, it's suitable only for batch processing, because the data needs to be indexed inside the database, and this costs resources. I have the data, I have to index it inside. Then I have to take the data, apply the template before processing it, another cost. And then I need to start the multiple process to analyze things. This is called batch processing, post-processing, call it as you prefer. The concept is, if I have 1,000 machine learning models working on the data, this is very costly in terms of resources. This means that, yes, I'm finding something in the iStack, but it takes too much time. So the problem currently for cyber threat hunting is that, uh, yes, we have the tools. We can store a lot of data. We can find things very well. But in most of the cases, uh, I have the result after two hours, three hours, one day because I have multiple machine learning models, multiple classification models, re-indexing, templating, blah, 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 everything done in parallel with an architecture that currently is suitable only to cloud. You know that, for example, Microsoft Sentinel performs things in a very strict amount of time. Yes, because they use 1,000 machines together, working all together. And this, in this case, you can solve the issue. But if you work in post-processing, the real problem is that the time is the real bottleneck. Just to show this, this is, for example, something that comes from Hadoop. Uh, if you want to manage one terabyte a day on Hadoop and store it, for example, for one month, you need two months, three months, etc. You need to have 33 machines working together. This means that growing and growing the data, storing and storing the data, the number of machines that I need to manage a distributed cluster, a distributed data lake, is huge and costs a lot. We did an experience, uh, say, OK, there exists the public cloud. Let's use the public cloud. Let's put the data there. Uh, unfortunately, the store of the data is the cost in the cloud. Uh, usually, uh, you pay very little for the machine, but uh, a lot for the data. So the data rest is the problem. And the real question is that the problem comes from, I need to be precise. Precise needs computation. Computation needs that I need more resources. Resources needs that I need to do things in post-processing because I need to store them before in the database, and then I can collect them to work on them. Or batch processing that is, uh, is worse because I need to manage things with the threads and so on. And post-processing means that I don't have real time. Uh, currently, this is uh, in most of the situation we found in the world, this is not considered an issue, because everyone tells it's better that I can check my hypothesis after I have the file to understand what happened and then to discover the root cause analysis, perform attribution, because you can do attribution on this, uh, respect to solve the issue when the file is in place. 
Why this? Because this is the reality. Uh, this comes from a study that has been done that, by the Poimon Institute, if I remember. Uh, most of the attacks, starting from the compromise to the data exfiltration, for example, in most of the cases works on minutes, hours. Because you know, most of the attacks are automated. You prepare the attack and then execute everything in a short amount of time. So the impact is very quick. The time needed to identify that there is a compromise, but then to contain everything takes, if you're lucky, days or weeks, or there is someone that costs on years. You can have 20% discover the problem after one year. So, because this is the situation, and everyone is, yeah, yeah, I need to deal with this, data leak is good. But because every company currently say, I cannot work on seconds, hours, minutes, I work on days, so data leak is enough for me. No, what? Uh, we tried to change regarding this. The first one is the real problem is that uh, the hypothesis currently comes from the CM or from the threat intelligence. A given hypothesis from the CM currently in this moment is useless. Uh, I started with the CM in 2001. It was called the Net Forensics. The good of Net Forensics is uh, you, I don't know, every one of you knows that the, at the time there were the intrusion detection systems. So there, these are simply tools that give an alerts without doing anything in the network, without doing anything in the system. So the idea of the CM is because you need to manually do something, I need to collect things to tell you, hey, you have a problem in this machine, and then you manually go in the machine. But currently, the countermeasures are active. We are talking about ADR, endpoint detection and response, NDR, network detection and response, XDR, extended detection and response, every SDR. Detection and response. This means that when the countermeasure discovers something wrong, give an alert and solve the issue. So the CM is useless. You are doing only statistics. Because if the antivirus, the DR, discover the malware means that also isolate the machine or solve the issue. So you are not telling nothing interesting. What we want to do is that uh, threat hunting must move from the situation when the countermeasures work in the situation when they know that the countermeasures don't work. This means that we need to work in the data lake in real time. And this is the issue that we take in our company since the beginning, in the novel approach that uh, I will talk next. The idea is, can we do this? Because we are talking about one million events per second collected. And in one million events per second, we need to discover the hypothesis and do something. Applying machine learning, classification, whatever, in real time. Not in batch processing, in post-processing. So, first of all, uh, if someone older like me uh, remember how the CM worked in the past, they talked about memory correlation rule and post-processing correlation rules. The idea of memory correlation rules is I have the CM that is collecting data, the data is put in memory, in RAM, and everything is managed in memory. I have the pattern detection, whatever detection, and so on. And finally, I have the persistence. This means that I use an approach that is called data in use. I am in the flow of the events, check for strange things there, and then if I find something wrong, I generate an alert. And everything is performed in memory. We will come back to the concept of memory. You have just <laughs> one million events per second in memory. It's difficult to manage, but we'll talk about this. But the first concept that I want to transfer to you is that this requires a schema on right approach. Uh, currently, most of the CM, as I told you before, most of the data lake are working on a schema on read approach. But if you want to work on this way, Unfortunately, 
you need to work on a schema on write approach because uh, the persistence comes after. And this is the clue. We need to manage everything in the flow. This is usually managed using stream processing, but it is not enough. What I want to do is to divide the computational resources needed to manage the events on different elements. So what we applied is to use distributed computing. The idea is to use fog computing, another buzzword. The concept is easier. We use this object that is called J connector. It's simply an object that performs normalization, parsing, filtering, aggregation, blah, 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 directly near the source. The idea is why I have to use resources in the central system to parse things. Let's do it near the sources. Uh, there is a solution, open source solution, that currently manages this way, it's a syslog ng. The concept is the same. The difference is that all the data collected by the sources is prepared before to be sent to the central system. This means that we uh, uh, load, we do a sort of offloading of the data using this approach. And this is the first point. Third point, in 2014, there was uh, Cisco uh, created the project. This was called OpenSock, then was then acquired by Apache. That's called Matter. Currently, it's in the attic because no one wants to develop on this, unfortunately. But the good of this project is that they defined an architecture to manage one million events per second. They, um, the test that they did in 2014, they arrived at one million and a half events, uh, and half events per second, and they can manage all the events in the pipeline, performing enrichment, threat intelligence, profiling, behavioral analytics, uh, triaging, uh, indexing, blah, blah, all in real time. This is important because uh, this is the baseline to manage what I said to you before. So the concept is that they don't use the typical Elasticsearch approach. I put everything inside Elasticsearch, and then I have batch processing, they manage things for me, and then Kibana to show the results. What they do is I use fog computing to prepare the data, and then I have a sort of stream processing capability that manages the data until it's written inside Elasticsearch. They use Elasticsearch just for searching, just for indexing and searching, not for reasoning, not to perform cyber threat hunting. Cyber threat hunting is, is managed in the flow. The concept behind this idea is, if I have a platform that is able to collect a million events per second, second point, and to contextualize every event, giving the geoposition, who is using the computer, uh, if I did the scan in the network, what was the result of the scan, everything that contextualizes a specific action that happens in my network. Who is doing the action, if it has did, some, if did something wrong in the past, if it is a good threat intelligence tells me something about this, because as much context I have for every event, more insight, better insight I can have to analyze things. What does it mean? That I simply, for every event, I generate a needle, an hypothesis. Every ingested event is an hypothesis. This is the change of paradigm. I have the event that's coming. It's an hypothesis of an attack. Let's check for this. If the validation gives to me that this is an attack, let's start for the pattern identification. And this is done for every, every event ingested in the system. This means that we put together the concept of validation with the concept of investigation. Every ingested event independently by this nature, if it's an alert, is a suspicious alert, or is something that is a white log, something that is good in my network, this is an hypothesis of an attack. Let's check for this. Uh, currently, you cannot manage this with the SOAR, because if someone of you has worked with the SOAR, you know that the SOAR usually is not a distributed system. Usually it's managed by one computer, two computers. So the, the SOAR has been created 
to automatize the tasks that has managed on the events. In this case, we have that every event, if I have one million events collected per second, I have one million of hypotheses per second. This is the concept. But still remain, this is the architecture, before moving to the next part. Uh, this is what we have developed. Uh, we use uh, the, the Apache stack uh, with SORM, Kafka. Uh, we are using Hadoop uh, for the model as a service. We'll turn back on this in the next. So the idea is I use Che connector to connect, to collect items for computing. I use Kafka to take the bust of events that comes in my system. I use Storm to distribute using stream processing the computation on all uh, my internal system to do enrichment, threat intelligence, and threat analysis. Threat analysis is managed with a specific domain-specific language that is, we call it Lunaris, that is uh, a functional language that can be used to analyze every event in a short amount of time that leverage on a profiler that is simply a system that takes every event for a specific class and generate a model for this. And use this model to check, for example, if there is an outlier. I have that the bytes are always the same. If you are outside uh, the Gaussian of the system, I give an alert and so on. And then there is a system that is a model as a service, who will talk it next, that is a sort of containerized system able to execute models machine learning models of every nature. So finally, I have the last part is the Kafka uh, queue, then write it down in Elastic. But when I write data in Elastic, everything has been triaged. Everything has been analyzed. The alerts has been created directly on the flow. So at the end, I have the investigation, the sporting, graph analysis, war room, whatever. So this means that uh, I can use the same system for both the two concepts. If I want to do uh, the SOC activities, I can simply use it, uh, the dashboarding or the graph analysis, and see, OK, I have an alert. I have this problem. I need to solve it. This is the war room. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do automation and so on. If I am a cyber threat hunting, I use the investigation part to understand what's happening to generate new IOC and so on. But I use the same platform in both the case. But I didn't solve this issue. And this is the main point. Still remains the problem, because if I am ingesting one million events per second, after 10 minutes, I think that doesn't exist currently a single computer with enough RAM inside, with enough memory inside to manage all of this. So the problem is, I cannot use memory. I need to solve the issue in another way. And this was the idea. First of all, we don't want to check for a specific vulnerability. We don't want to check for a specific procedure. We want to check for a specific path. As I told you before, one of the side effects of the Mitra attack matrix is, uh, I don't know how one of you knows the situation calculus in uh, artificial intelligence. So situation calculus means I have actions that change my world. These actions change the situation in my world, so generate effects in my world that then can be used by another action and another action and another action to generate a chain. This means that when an attack is in place, uh, I have actions that can be also unknown actions that generate changes in my world, and these changes can be chained with another action, with another action, with another action. So the problem is not to discover the specific action, the specific procedure, but to discover the sequence. Also, if I have some holes because I don't know something well in uh, the process, the good is that the attacker needs to generate the path. I need only to understand if the indicators that I have, as much as possible, respond to a specific sequence that can be similar to an attack. The concept is this one. Uh, this has been applied to images. This has been applied to movies. This has been applied to music. 
The concept is why we need precision also to understand if something wrong is in my network. I don't want to understand what is the exact technique that has been. This is good for a black swan, something that wants to reverse the attack and then generate a malware for this. Yes, that's good. But when I'm doing a response activities or I'm doing a separate attempting, I'm interested only respect to validate the hypothesis and build the pattern. This is my intention. So I don't want to be precise in terms of what to understand. And here comes the concept that we applied. Currently, uh, this is another buzzword. Probably there, was, there will be a market guide in the next few months. Comes from Gartner. They called them composite AI. The concept is I cannot generate a machine learning model that can solve every situation. It can be very good to say, OK, I have a huge amount, a huge data set, put everything together, less training using a deep learning, whatever, and generate the model that check for every instance that is bad. I decide this, but this is impossible. Because when you observe, in my opinion, the world in a complete way, this is entropy. And you know that machine learning and entropy means that is white noise. This means that everything is probabilistic in the same way. This means that you cannot decide anything. So the concept is not to check for everything. The idea is to combine different machine learning models, rules model, blah, 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 to validate a specific hypothesis. So use not only one machine learning model, but different kind of solution to validate the same hypothesis. This is the concept. And here comes the difference. Uh, you know that inside the Metron architecture, there was a, a module that was called Profiler. We can use Profiler for probabilistic matching. I don't know how, much, how many of you knows what is Hyperlog Log Plus or Bloom Filters. Bloom Filters means I want a probabilistic model that tell me if this event happened in the last amount of time. Probabilistic. This means that uh, if the answer is yes, it's occurred. If the answer is no, mm, not so true. Can be also occurred that you don't know it. Hyperlog log plus is for the cardinality. I want to understand if the events happened more than 10 times last one hour. Probabilistic again. If it say yes, it's good, can be 10 or 11 or 12, 13, 14, 40. If it say no, hmm, maybe can be 10, 11, but not more different from this. But the concept is that I don't need to store in memory all the logs. I simply have to maintain this model. The memory that I need for this model is one kilobyte. So it's very efficient. The problem is that it's not precise. But if I wanted to do more, I can use it also for machine learning. If I use the same profiler also for the, if you're using, for example, outline the rainforest, outline detection, uh, sensitive hashing, blah, 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 whatever, I can use the same approach of the profile also to understand if the new event is in line with the previous ones. So this means that I can do a sort of unsupervised classification model to say, let's check in the last two hours. Does this event is compliant with what happened in the last two hours, in the last day, in the last month? Yes, no. I don't require memory for this. This is statistics. Only a few amount of kilobytes. So we applied this together with all the rest. I talked to you about the Mass, model as a service model. Uh, there is a strong limitation for this because we need to change things uh, using models that are stateless, pre-trained, uh, they need to be called using a REST API, blah, 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 or limitations that are fundamental to work in stream processing activities because uh, I cannot share memory, I cannot share information, I need to work on one million events per second. So I need to have models very quick, very simple, that uh, works directly on a specific pre-trained asset. So combining uh, profi statistical profiles with Bloom filters, Hyperlog Log Plus, and using machine learning models in this way, we can 
cover all these possibilities. These are the typical analysis that needs to be done inside uh, a system that uh, can support a cyber threat hunting. So this means that for known knowns, uh, yes, uh, the first one is easier. It's a simple a filter. The second one is multiple account failures, hyperlog log plus, bloom filter. The third one is the profiler or the mass. We can also solve the unknown unknowns because I can generate using the profiler something that say, for example, using rainforest to say, okay, this is the logs that I catch. This is the entities that I need to observe. Tell me simply if the next event don't comply with the previous series. We can do this in this moment. And we don't need the memory for this. So we can work one million events per second in real time. Now, the problem is the bias. Uh, I told to you before, yes, this is probabilistic, so you can have a lot of false positives. And we solved the issue using multiverdict analysis. This means that we can check for a problem, validate an hypothesis using horizontal multiverdict analysis, multiple triage that are matched inside the same events, or vertical multiverdict analysis. In time, I see that there is a correlation between triage that are related to one each other to generate a chain. Using these two approaches, we can solve the last problem of the, because we are not precise. So the concept is for every event, I generate an hypothesis. Coming from the hypothesis, I use multiverdict analysis to analyze using different kind of profiling activities or machine learning models or deep learning models, all the elements that uh, horizontally or vertically confirm my hypothesis. At the end of the day, I know that there is something bad in place. And I have also the context. Remember that I have the context linked with the system. So the concept is that in one shot, I have not only the validation, but also the pattern. So I solved the two points of the cyber threat hunting. Not only validated the hypothesis, but to identify what's the sequence. This one. Uh, how we can create, what we created, uh, rules like this. In this case, uh, our idea is to use digital twin to validate and generate such kind of rules. Because the rules are not precise, the problem is how a human can generate rules that are not precise, uh, that discover something that is unknown. So the concept is to use a digital twin to push different kind of data sets, different kind of using also cause engineering, for example, different things, so that I can check or train the system on the other side to discover such issues in a short amount of time. Uh, we applied this in real cases. Uh, currently, we are using in tactical military operation, for example, because if you have a tactical common uh, in a part of the world. The problem is that you need to adapt immediately to the specific situation, so we can use it just to train immediately what's happening and to tailor all the profiles or the machine learnings to discover the threats that we need. Still remain the last part. You remember, cyber threat hunting, you have hypothesis, then I validate, then I discover the pattern, and finally, I need to improve. So the concept is, because I can check this in real time, why I cannot apply this in real time also for what regards reaction? So the concept is, uh, can I do something immediately according to what hap is happening in my network? Now, the real problem, I know every one of you probably are working with the SOAR, uh, there is a, a bias for what regards uh, uh, the playbooks. The first one is that the playbooks uh, depends by the context. If you have the firewall, if you have the ADR, if you have the antivirus, whatever. If you don't have them, you cannot automate anything. So the playbook is useless. So uh, the concept of the structure of the playbook depends by the context. This is the problem. What you have installed in your network. Second, the actions that I decide to do depends by the situation. There is not an action that you can apply every time, every time, everywhere, in every situation. It depends by what's the status of your network. There are things that you can do if you are in a specific situation. There are things that you cannot do. Suppose that you are a military naval environment. You cannot switch off your combat system if you are 
doing the work. But uh, a SOAR tells you which of the computer. <laughs> this is what happens for the playbook. So the concept is that the situation tells you if you can do something or not do something. But finally, currently, most of the playbooks that exist in the market are most for validation. Remember what I told you since the beginning. Usually, we, we are using SOAR just to do it quicker and quicker what humans do manually. So this means that uh, in terms of reaction, the only things that happens is apply the patch, switch the computer, uh, take the computer off on the network, uh, destroy everything, call mom. This is what you can do, and nothing else. So can we solve this? First point that we talk in our solution, the idea is, OK, let's first of all work on standards. Uh, we want to avoid to generate playbooks in a library that is not open. Let's use a standard to define a playbook so that we can adapt this in every situation. Uh, currently, we are using Cacao from Moesis. Uh, there are some reasons for this. I will tell it next. Uh, respect to COPS, that is the other one. Uh, because uh, they don't think only about the playbook, but also in the automation of the countermeasures. Because, yes, you can have a playbook that say, OK, uh, do a scanner, a scanning on this IP address. Good. But the problem is, who developed the adapter that talk with the Nessus or with the Qualys or Tenable, uh, sorry, with Nessus, uh, with the Rapid7 to tell, do the scan? They solved this issue with the concept of OpenC2. The concept is that you have Cacao that defines the playbook, and OpenC2 that tells how you can automate things on this item. Second point, why I need to have the playbooks inside the SOAR or inside the CM? Why I cannot have them inside the CTI, the Cyber Threat Intelligence Platform? Uh, these people in 2021 do a very interesting paper to say, hey, we used uh, Cacao for playbooks, and we put them inside the MISP. And then we have the SOAR, or the CM, that is able to take this playbook and execute it directly. So the playbook becomes something that is dynamic. I can change it using the same threat intelligence pattern that I have for IOC, IOA, Sticks, whatever. So this means that I can use the course of action, and this is the, the mapping that they did in the MISP. For example, the cost. Playbook can destroy the network. If I say switch off that computer, this means that I don't have this capability anymore. So this have a cost, and this cost needs to be enumerated. It needs to be told to the analyst, because you are losing a capability. Uh, it has an impact, because it can generate something wrong in the network. The network doesn't work anymore. Uh, it has an efficacy. Can work, not work, I don't know, probably. So the concept is, using MISP, so the solution, the CM and the SOAR, is able to manage the playbooks directly loading them from the CM, from the MISP, and using them, I can manage this kind of process. I have the war room. In the war room, I have all the hypotheses that has been validated and the patterns that has been discovered. And in the war room, I have both the cyber threat hunters and the responders working together, exchanging things. Now go chat GPT, you can also exchange things, tell stories, stories, and so on. So you can coordinate things. Let's discover this. Let's check for that. Check mostly for this. Um, do an in-depth analysis on these events, and so on. And then, behind the curtains, you have orchestration, automation, and action. Automation and action are managed using the standards that I told you before and are uploaded directly by the CTI platform, the tech, uh, threat intelligence platform. What changes is the orchestration is based on the triggering. This means that playbooks starts when some conditions have met. 
I have conditions, the playbook starts. It's not managed by the human, but it's managed by conditions. The only difference is that if the playbook has some risks or can destroy a capability, I alert the human to say, hey, I want to start this playbook. If I start this playbook, you lose this capability. Do I have to do this? Yes, no. This is what happens in the war room level. But all the rest happens behind the curtains. This is the architecture. So we need, obviously, aggregation, because I have uh, multiple events that come, because you know the attackers move in the flow. This means that uh, when I discover the pattern, I have new events that enforce the pattern. All these patterns need to be stored in the same war room, because I need to collect everything in the same place. And in the same place, I have the triggering part that starts playbooks. Playbook starts generate new observables that comes in the war room. So this means that is a live environment when I have hypothesis, validation of hypothesis that has done during the detection part, pattern analysis and response with feedbacks continuously working in the same environment. And then I have, obviously, the notification management system, because, unfortunately, managers need to be notified with respect, hey, you have an attack, hey, we are suffering, and so on. So you need also something that, according to some rules, tells to the managers, to the decision makers, what's happening currently in the world. But the concept is, I, is like a storm processing. I have everything working on this, triggering that activate playbooks, playbooks that generate new information, information that is managed by cyber threat answer to discover if the response is good and generate new response. These new response are loaded inside the MISP platform and then used by the system to manage the playbook in the better way. Now, uh, for what regards triggering, we have different ways we can manage this. Uh, the easier one is the static uh, precondition. This means I have a Boolean filter in the beginning of the playbook that say these are the conditions when you are, can execute the playbook. Currently, we are working in this way. This means that uh, if uh, uh, something is uh, have a, a sort of severity, I don't know, more than 10, execute the playbook. Very trivial, but it works. Uh, what we are studying currently is the use an heuristic uh, choice. You remember that when you define the playbook inside the threat intelligence platform, you can define the efficacy of the playbook. So the concept is, uh, let's start with an efficacy that is 100%. Then you execute the playbook. If the playbook fails, downgrade the efficacy, I don't know, 80%, 50%, until it comes to 0%. This means the playbook is useless. This means that uh, while the system is working, we can change the efficacy. And we can do this because, we remember, we have the playbooks inside the MISP. So we can change them in real time. But we want to do more. The last action that we want to do is to use reinforcement learning using a chaotic choice for playbooks. This means, we will tell this better now, let's define a playbook, whatever, and execute this. If it works, give a score that is good. And then you use reinforcement learning to say, hey, that's good. If it doesn't work, OK, don't reward it and drop it. So the concept is, because I don't know what's the best action that they can do inside the network, and I do a chaotic action. Uh, it's the same when you have to train, for example, an animal, the dog. You say, sit down. If you sit down, you give a reward. If you don't sit down, you don't give to him anything. And the same is for the playbook. Generate the playbook, whatever. It's not important. Switch off the entire data center. OK, it's good. Execute it. It's good. No, because I don't have enough data center. OK, don't reward it. Drop it. Now, the problem is, can I apply this at home in a real environment? Remember that you have a military <laughs> implant to say, let's choose chaotically what to do. Then if we, uh, if we are resilient, it's good. So 
we are working on this project that is called High Inception currently, so it's something that is still in process. Uh, the idea is to leverage on modeling and simulation to generate playbooks, to, ge to use them and to use reinforcement learning to select the best one. So we don't want to try it at all. What we want to do is, OK, let's use chaos engineering to generate playbooks, then uh, put it inside the sort of modeling and situational environment, check what's the effect, and then give the rewards. Uh, then we go in the mission, we apply them, and then we record all the activities. And when we come back home, use the same system with the new data set to understand if everything has worked fine. And we restart again the reinforcement learning process. So it's sort of live uh, management of the information. This is uh, what we are currently doing. And this is, we hope that it works fine. This is an R&D activities. Uh, we think that uh, in uh, an entropic world, probably using entropy to solve entropy can be a very good idea. This is our bet. Finally, and we close with this, because I am working in real time, uh, the action can be different. Yes, I have a switch off. Let's put the backup, uh, change this, change that. But I can also adapt, reshape, decept, or reverse. Because I catch the, the problem while the problem is in place. So this means that I have more options. Because I have the attacker in my network, for example, I can reverse the attack. Or I can decept the attack. This means I generate a fake network, an onipot, call it in this way and make the attacker lose its time on this fake network. This is what we are trying to develop now. Uh, this is based, again, on a digital twin. The idea is I have all the coils, breadcrumbs, different techniques that can be used, that can be orchestrated by the system. When the system discovers that the attack is in place and is late, the IP address or the machines that is used by the attacker, I simply redirect it in some ways, passive or active, uh, in the digital twin. And then I have two choices. The first one is the typical on in net choice. I study it to understand who is it. I perform a reverse attack. I put something there. Or uh, simply, I can make it losing time. I give, you, I give to him a fake database. A fake information is, oh, I find passwords, I find databases, let's break this, oh, I have the wing controller, let's do privilege escalation. Yes, yes, yes. it's like uh, a sort uh, of game in some way. So I can use this just to solve the issue and in some way take time. Remember that the problem is the time frame of the attacker respect to the defender. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm changing the timeline of the attacker. Uh, delaying his activity, I have more time to understand what's happening. And this means that I can do also a better attribution, I can do a better response, and I can survive and have a better resilience in my network. So this is more or less the presentation. I don't know if uh, more or less I am in time. I think that 17 seconds at the end. So I don't know if... Uh, Questions? Thanks. I think that we can extend for another couple of minutes so we can uh, pose some questions to Andrea. Please go ahead. If you're them. Yeah. Yeah. In the, in the last few slides, you, you actually had a, it looked like AI creating the response. Do you have any concerns that possibly an attacker could use that to their advantage to make an, uh, a destructive AI response? Good question, because as you know, as defender use machine learning, also attacker can use machine learning. So uh, there is a problem related to the fact that they can study your posture and then generate uh, something that uh, fake your systems. Uh, for this reason, when it talk about 
uh, the system, uh, if you remember, there is a sort of orchestration and the validation part. Uh, our idea is, because I have playbooks that can be dynamically generated and changed along time, I have always the man in the loop. Remember, when talking about composite AI, the idea is that uh, I have machine learning, but the man is in the loop. So the concept is not to have the system behaving automatically to solve the issue, except when you need to solve the issue because otherwise you are dead. The automatic countermeasures. But this is done by the countermeasures, usually. The concept is how I can explain to you that something wrong is happening, uh, what I can do if I execute an action and this action doesn't work. For this reason, we are talking about reinforcement learning, heuristical choice, and so on. Because uh, in our opinion, I can apply this, but if it doesn't work, or because the attacker wants that you do this action, then because it needs to generate another time the same action, the orchestrator say, hey, I already did this. Probably there is someone that is trying to fake your system. What I have to do? So the concept is not only to automate execution, but to also to give visibility to the owner what's happening. Explainability is called in this way, but yes, in our opinion, we don't want to use indeed machine learning to generate dynamically action and reaction. We want to use machine learning to generate the playbooks. Then validation, execution, orchestration is always in the end of the cyber threat hunter. This is the point. Oh. <laughs> it works. Um, the distinction of the on-premises versus cloud, is your solution more tied into the on-premises? Because with the cloud, for example, if it's the wide providers, there's a limitation there, obviously, the network limitations. Very good question. Uh, the problem of the cloud is that it seems limitless. So everyone say, Mm, I cannot solve the issue, let's put more machines. In the cloud, it's possible. Uh, this is an important bias because it's not true. Being on-premise or being on cloud, the resources cost. Uh, also, uh, to, uh, currently, I have a discussion with a friend of mine respect to containerization. Currently, say, if you use Kubernetes, it's better because you use many resources and so on. You need to use resources. So the problem is the sustainability of the platform. Uh, I don't tell you that we are on premise or on cloud. I tell you that it's a sustainable architecture that can work with less resources as possible to manage the same problem. Now, the bad thing is that you lose in precision, as I told you. Uh, but I think, in my opinion, uh, also with the data that we have on field, Mm, this is enough because we need to discover the attacker in a short amount of time with the less resources possible. And no one, obviously, can be, also myself, I, I need to have a cluster with 1,000 Elasticsearch uh, nodes. Very good. Yes, you can check it in one milliseconds. Yes, it works. But you need 1,000 nodes in the cloud or on-premise. Well, on-premise, this is easier because 1,000 machines, a big data center, in the cloud, no one tells you that the problem is not the number of machines, but the number of data. Because if you know how works Elasticsearch, if you want real-time analysis, you can index only maybe three terabytes, four terabytes for a single node. So imagine that you have a petabyte that needs to be indexed and make the multiplication of how much nodes you need to have to have the answer in a short amount of time in seconds. This is the problem. So what we introduced is not a cloud or on-premise architecture. You can install it on cloud, install it in Amazon, it's not a problem. But how you can use a sustainable architecture that can manage one million events per second without losing money on storing data in the NoSQL database, but storing data only when you need them. This is the concept. I don't know if this answers the question. I like very much. I like very much your statement about you don't like accuracy, <laughs> but uh, it's like by yes variance in <laughs> yes. machine learning. Yes, yes. Um, the question is, 
what is your advice from your experience? How to find the balance between accuracy and quality of data? Uh, this is the point. Uh, the concept is validation. I make my rules and so on. How can I be sure that the rules that I have are enough to solve the issue? Uh, unfortunately, uh, there is not the real question. What we discovered is that attackers, usually independently by the context, want more or less the same thing and want to generate more or less the same effects inside the network. Uh, if I want to install a malware, it's not important the way I install the malware. I need to have a, a hidden process in execution inside the machines that connect back to a command and control system. And this is for every malware that exists in the world that do exfiltration or need a, a, a command and control. So the idea is, I didn't tell this before, don't create rules accurate enough to detect the vulnerability, but I told to you to detect the chain, the effects that they generate in the world. Uh, this has a very strong change in the paradigm, which means that uh, countermeasures are useless, except the countermeasures that tell me if a suspicious action is in place. So we need the tons of countermeasures that works on behaviors, strange behaviors. This process, whitelisting, for example. Oh, this process, I never see it strange. This is good for us. Why this? Because in this case, all the rules that we can create uh, are independent with respect to the specific, specific context, but depends by the situation. So we can leverage on the knowledge base every time to manage better and better the accuracy. Otherwise, if you start every time with the, uh, with the draft, with the something that is empty, it is a mess to generate rules, to generate things every time. Uh, we applied this starting from naval environment. Currently, we are bringing it to airborne environment, land environment, military environment, or whatever. And the good is that uh, we can change what are the sensors, called it in this way. Uh, but we, need, we know what is the semantic that we need to understand what we need, what, what we want. So the concept for this is when I told to you uh, schema on right, normalization since the beginning. Because if I normalize things, the semantic, in the right way, starting from the sensor, what happens in the network, more or less the communication are the same. So I don't want to manage models understanding the semantic of the environment, but the semantic of the attacker. This is what I'm doing. Yes, it's difficult, because to manage it, it is a try and fail model. But uh, we started uh, applying this, well, we started from land since the beginning, then we moved to Naval, for example, this year. Uh, more or less, uh, we saw that uh, some unknown unknowns we're covered also if we don't know them. Obviously, you can have false positives again. But for this reason, cyber threat hunters uh, will have work also in another, in another millennium. So we are in cyber threat hunting 3.0. So it doesn't mean that you don't need cyber threat hunters. <laughs> we are simplifying it, their work. <laughs> So thank you, Andrea. I think with this, uh, we'll conclude this session. Thank you so much for this uh, information-rich and thought-provoking presentation. And on behalf of the center, I'd like to... Ah, thank to, you. Uh, I don't know if it's a white <laughs> rabbit. Maybe it is. Oh, it's a, it's a cyber threat hunting. What's yeah. this? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thanks Thanks so very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.